Hello everyone and welcome to Net Diligence Virtual Cyber Risk Summit. My name is Heather Osborne and I'm the Director of Global Events and Programming here at Net Diligence, a cyber assessment and data breach services company. We are pleased to extend our thought leading content into the virtual space with this webinar series. Visit the conferences page on our website www.netdiligence.com to find out more about our online and in-person programs. Before we begin today, I'd like to extend our gratitude to our virtual cyber risk sponsors and our nearly 100 industry leading speakers without whom this program would not be possible. For today's webinar, we will be using the ON24 platform. Right now, you should be viewing the ON24 dashboard, which shows the live viewing screen and other features. During this presentation, all participants will be in listen mode only. Today's presentation will last approximately 60 minutes. Panelists will be taking your questions throughout the presentation. Simply type in your question and hit submit. You may also use this feature for technical questions. In the bottom corner, you will see a widget called Resources, where you can download assets our presenters and sponsors have provided. Just click on the resource and it will be automatically downloaded. If you are interested in receiving CLE or CE credit for today's webcast, please navigate to the CLE CE box in the lower right hand corner to make your selection. This will ensure that you are emailed the CLE CE questionnaire to complete your application for credit. Additionally, please note that you must remain online for the duration of the program and answer the three polling questions that appear during the presentation. As a reminder, this webcast is being recorded. Following the conclusion of this webcast, you will be sent an archive link for further viewing or sharing with colleagues. This webinar will also be available on demand on our website. Again, thank you for joining us here at Net Diligence today. We hope you enjoy the program. Good morning, everyone. My name is James Lee, the moderator of this panel. Uh, I'm a partner at Boy Schiller Flexner and I handle data privacy litigation for the firm on both the defense side on behalf of cyber insurance carriers and on the plaintiff side uh, on behalf of uh, classes and class actions. This is Net Diligence's U.S. litigation update. And before I introduce the, the wonderful and talented panel Net Diligence has brought for you today, I wanted to briefly preview what the panel will be discussing um, with you today in the world of data privacy. Now, when we think of data privacy litigation, most people think of data breach. That's when a company holding sensitive personal information gets hacked and a customer sues, claiming that the company was negligent in protecting their data. Companies and insurers have been thinking about and dealing with data breach or this type of fact pattern for many years now. But the second less common type of litigation um, which is data privacy litigation or data tracking, um, that's a, a new issue that's been emerging um, for the last few years. Now, in that type of case, um, the claim uh, is, is much different than data breach. So data breach is where the defendant essentially failed to safeguard the data. But in a data privacy litigation, the claim is that the defendant should never have had the data to begin with. Or even if they did, they used that data in some improper way. So the insurance industry has typically looked at risk analysis from a, of data privacy issues from the perspective of data breach. Uh, in 2020, I think data privacy, in, in the manner that I've described, is becoming more and more of a focus. And there are several reasons for this shift. Um, there, are, there have been specific laws uh, passed to combat improper data collection. There have been recent court decisions giving plaintiffs standing to seek rights or private rights of action, even without proving specific out-of-pocket losses. And we've also seen the tech giants that have come under fire for their data tracking activities are starting to shift the blame to first-party websites, which implicates millions of companies. Now, those in the audience who are in the insurance industry may be asking, well, how does that impact me? Well, this could have implications for the insurance industry too. For example, when Yahoo was sued in 2013, for unlawfully extracting data from Yahoo mail messages. Yahoo demanded a 
costs of defense and indemnification from its insurer. The courts recently found that this type of activity was covered under the insurance policy and even allowed Yahoo to collect its fees for having to litigate the issue. So a lot's happening in this area, and it's sort of unclear where it's all headed. That's why I brought for you um, panelists who are on the absolute cutting edge of different aspects of this new focus on data tracking. Some come from the plaintiff side, and some come from the defense side, and they don't always agree um, with what the implications of data tracking or data privacy litigation are. And I think that will make for an interesting discussion. So I'm going to ask them to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, first, we have David Strait from uh, Kaplan Fox. Um, David? Thanks, James. Yes, this is David Strait. Uh, I am a plaintiff side data privacy lawyer, uh, although I am now pursuing claims on behalf of uh, what we would call victims of data tracking or data breaches. Uh, I started my career on the defense side, so now I've split maybe half my career defense-oriented, half plaintiff side, so I think that gives me an interesting focus anyway here. Um, I'm based in New York, and in my spare time, I also teach business law and ethics at Yeshiva University in the EMBA program. Thanks, David. Uh, now we have um, Eve Lynn Rapp from the Edelson firm. Eve, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I first wanted to thank everyone for attending and the Net Diligence team for always hosting very interesting and thought-provoking panels, and to all my fellow panelists who I've learned a lot from in our recent discussions. Um, I am a partner at Edelson PC, a law firm based in Chicago and San Francisco. We focus on plaintiffs, class, mass, and government litigation. Over the years, I've been appointed class counsel or led litigation efforts in a dozen of privacy matters, sorry, dozens of privacy matters, and have secured judgments of, and, or settlements of over a billion dollars. My firm is very well known for their leadership role in the Spokio v. Robbins case. We have also filed uh, a first of its kind, a DIPA class action against Facebook that was just settled for $650 million. Um, and so we have been at the forefront of much of this privacy litigation that we will be discussing today. Great. Thanks, Eve. Uh, last but not least, we have Doug Meal from Oric. Doug? Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, uh, James. And echoing what you said, many thanks to Net Diligence uh, for uh, having me on the panel, and uh, I much appreciate everyone who's joined us today for the session. Uh, so I am uh, a partner at Oric, and uh, I lead the litigation and regulatory enforcement side of our privacy and cybersecurity practice at Oric. So. What that means is that uh, I defend uh, American companies against unjust accusations brought by people like mm -hmm. David and Eve uh, against <laughs> them for uh, having violated their legal obligations around the privacy or the uh, security of consumer information. It's going to be a good panel, I can tell. Um, all right, let's move on to the next slide. Um, this is the first polling question we have uh, for the audience. The question is true or false. Whereas data breach involves a failure to safeguard data, data privacy litigation involves whether a party should have had the data in the first place. So please just mark true or false to that question. All right, moving on. We have our agenda for the day. Um, today, the panelists are going to discuss uh, the emerging areas of privacy litigation um, involving four separate topics. Uh, the first is uh, the integration of analytics to track users. The second is geolocation tracking. The third is ed tech tracking. And the final topic will be data mapping. We will also discuss how uh, these emerging areas of privacy litigation may impact defendants beyond just the tech giants like the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. All right, so the, the first topic is integration of analytics and privacy issues. 
And I think, David, uh, you're going to talk a little bit about that, right? Sure. Thanks, James. Uh, I think the first place to start before we go uh, into what's changed in the past year and why this is a hot topic is just to start with an overview of what is analytics, how does it work. And, and most people uh, probably know this better than I do and better than we lawyers know, but it's important to focus on one particular aspect of what is involved in analytics because that will in turn define what the legal obligations are. Typically speaking, we're talking about a website. Maybe it's a consumer website um, where the consumer, say, uh, or maybe it's a news website, say it's CNN.com, and I'm on my home computer or on my mobile device, and I'm using a browser to access CNN.com. Analytics would be code that is embedded into the website by CNN. The code could come from Google, one of its companies like DoubleClick. It could be a social media company like Facebook. It could be LinkedIn. These could be in the form of a social uh, media widget. It could be a tracking pixel, which is invisible to the eye, but it accomplishes the same thing. What all of these devices have in common is its code integrated by the first-party website that then causes the browser of the user to report information to the third party. So it's information that's collected by CNN, information that I communicate from my browser to CNN. CNN then communicates information back to my browser, helping the browser to render the image of the website. And there's a communication going back and forth between me and that first party website. It is a conversation. It uh, includes content. And the content of that communication, along with other user identifying information, is then packaged up by the browser at the direction of the first party website, then reported to a third party like an analytics company. The most famous, of course, are Facebook and Google, but there are now hundreds of them. That understanding that construct is really important for a number of reasons. Number one is typically the information is personally identifiable. And for those in the audience who understand even the basics of data privacy law, once the information is not anonymized, once we understand it to be personal information, there are greater protections. And number two, for those who know about wiretap laws, if we're talking about the content of communication, a whole different set of laws will apply. Um, and the communications going between my browser and CNN are typically thought of as communications which beyond simply the IP address, if you look at the full file path of what's being communicated, that is considered typically to be the content of communication. Dispute, of course, as to how sensitive it is, if it's just CNN.com, that's maybe less sensitive if it's me going to CNN.com forward slash how do I um, adjust mental health concerns during the pandemic, that can be a, a much more sensitive article that I'm reading. Either way, the technology that's being employed involves this multi-step process happening simultaneously in the background. So the integration of analytics, it's, it's, it should be thought of by the first party website as a mechanism to instruct the user's browser to report some fairly sensitive information, sometimes personally identifiable information, to third parties. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing to remember is that about 20 years ago, there was a general consensus that such tracking technology is lawful. It is the basis of the modern uh, internet economy. Um, if you go to CNN.com, they may or may not collect your personal information, if you're signed in or not. Um, some websites have subscriber information, have passwords. For example, if you go to WSJ.com, there'd be a password. But even if there's not, even if the outsourcing of the collection of data goes to a third party, it's generally thought of as lawful. The case that established the basic construct is called in-ray double-click privacy litigation. Double-click prior to being purchased by Google was already the leading company in this space. And double-click, the double-click case established the lawfulness of the basic construct for three reasons. First is that there's implicit consent from the users because these sort of technologies can easily and at no cost be blocked, right? Um, you can put a cookie blocker in place, uh, whether by choosing it or by choosing a browser that by default blocks, like Safari, blocks the third party 
uh, um, trackers unless you choose to turn that off. Second, um, the, the websites typically are thought to have consented to the communication, and at least for the wiretap part of this uh, analysis, the uh, website only needs to have one party to the communication consenting to the sharing of the conversation with the third party trackers. You don't need, at least for federal purposes, uh, both parties to consent. Um, and then finally, is that uh, trackers typically respect the same origin policy. So Google may view its own cookies on my browser, but Facebook can't view the Google cookies. O only, um, only cookies that are quote you know owned by Google can be read by Google, and um, only those Facebook cookies uh, that are Facebook cookies can be um, viewed by Facebook. What that means is that a third-party tracking cookie can only be set as a third-party tracker. It cannot be set as a first-party cookie. For those three reasons, we generally think of tracking as lawful. However, what's changed? Well, as the technology has evolved and gotten more sophisticated, these basic rules are becoming blurred. So is it actually possible now, over the, say, over the last 20 years, to block the tracking? If the tracking is not being accomplished through, say, a traditional third-party tracking cookie, what if you could sync first-party cookies behind the scenes so that they kind of function as, as third-party uh, tracking cookies? Uh, what about fingerprinting and other sorts of identifications? What about browser identifiers uh, that are set um, by some of the larger tech companies? This new change in technology that's evolving year after year calls into question the basic construct of NRA double click. It means it's less certain that the tracking is automatically lawful. So the first major test of the evolving technology on the original basic uh, um, outline was NRA, Google, and cookie uh, placement. In that case, that followed uh, the disclosure um, in the press, it was through a, a blogger in Australia actually. Um, uh, and then eventually the FTC and the state AGs investigated, uh, Google had been circumventing the, uh, uh, the cookie blocker protections on Safari. And they claimed it was a glitch, regardless of whether it was or it wasn't. It enabled the, uh, the placement of tracking cookies through a JavaScript workaround. And the practice was ended. There was a, a consent uh, decree with uh, the FTC and um, several million dollars of fines are paid, also some state attorneys general. And there was also a, uh, a data privacy class action. It went to the Third Circuit. And the Third Circuit um, discussed the original DoubleClick opinion from 15 years earlier and said, no, the, the presumption in DoubleClick doesn't apply. It's not a lawful collection of the user data because it was achieved through deception and disregard of the cookie blocking settings on Safari. So um, it was con so the plaintiffs had a viable tort theory to proceed upon. However, the Third Circuit said, but because the Wiretap Act, the Federal Wiretap Act, re uh, only requires one party to the communication to consent to the sharing or the interception, there is no viable wiretap claim. So it was kind of a split decision. If we fast forward um, to April of this year, Facebook faced a similar problem where it wasn't a workaround. It wasn't the use of a secret JavaScript form to get around the cookie blockers. It instead was merely a represent to the Facebook subscribers. Well, if you're not logged into your Facebook account, we won't track what you're doing on these other websites. That representation was false and it went to the Ninth Circuit and uh, the Ninth Circuit ruled just like the Third Circuit did, that when the tracking is accomplished allegedly through deceit and disregard, uh, there is a viable privacy tort. But the Ninth Circuit went further than the Third Circuit and said, and furthermore, we don't think that the Wiretap Act uh, exception applies here, that we're not going to consider the tracker to be a party to the communication between David and CNN. It's instead an interception of that communication. Um, Facebook is not considered an automatic party. So it, it extended liability under the Wiretap Act that wasn't present in, in, the, uh, in the Third Circuit decision, but is now. 
Additionally, the Ninth Circuit said, and there's one other thing we should talk about, and that's the question of whether there's economic harm flowing from unlocking of web browsing. And the answer is yes. And that overturns implicitly uh, more than 30 cases. Many of you on this, uh, watching this panel may remember there have been a number of cases that were dismissed from the federal courts for lack of jurisdiction, saying that if there's no out-of-pocket harm to the victim of the surveillance, if there's no diminution in the value of the data that was unlawfully copied, there's actually no economic harm stemming from that action, and therefore there's no jurisdiction in the federal courts. The Ninth Circuit said that's not true anymore. If the state law provides an equitable remedy of disgorgement or restitution, those measures of damages count as economic harm in the federal courts. And that's, I think, a, a more important uh, sea change coming from this decision than the extension of the wiretap liability. I think it's going to have a lot of impact, not just in these surveillance cases, but also in traditional data breach cases. So that's what's changed on the analytics side. Um, that's why it's important to pay attention um, to uh, how these sort of tracking technologies are integrated on your websites uh, because of these um, recent developments. Thanks, David. Um, so David, uh, I have a question for you, which is, you know, we understand um, how Facebook and, the, and Google and perhaps Yahoo uh, may face um, new liability uh, given the sea change going on, um, in particular in the Ninth Circuit. But, you know, how would this impact um, first-party websites um, or the, the millions of websites that perhaps use analytics um, or these widgets or bits of code um, provided by the Facebooks and the Googles of the world? Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a practical answer and then there's a, a second answer. So as a practical matter here, because the large data companies can no longer, uh, if this Ninth Circuit decision holds, and it, it may be headed to the Supreme Court in the next two months, um, I, I'm, I'm actually honored to have been the person who argued the Facebook Internet tracking case to the Ninth Circuit, and I know that we are soon to be facing a cert petition coming from, meaning a, a request from, uh, the, uh, from Facebook to, for Supreme Court review, um, if that happens, then, then, then there may be uh, a change. But yeah, assuming the Ninth Circuit decision stands, companies like Facebook and Google can no longer simply say, hey, we're not liable, nobody's liable under a, a, the Wiretap Act because we are a party to the communication. We're receiving a copy, but we're kind of a party to this final conversation between the browser and us. Because that's no longer a viable defense, their only option is to go back to the original construct of the double-click decision, which is that okay, the uh, first-party website that's disclosing the information, right, because the first-party website is ordering the browser in turn to make a copy of the communication and send it to Facebook. If the only remaining defense is to say that, ah, it's the first party that's consented to the copying and sharing of the communication, necessarily that now means that the big data companies, I suspect, will start to blame the first-party websites for the sharing, which means it's up to the first party website not only to defend the action, but to adduce evidence that they in fact got consent or didn't have a representation that they wouldn't share the information, which would uh, then make the consent invalid. Got it. Um, I think this brings us to our next polling question, um, which is rate your awareness of data tracking litigation, either very aware, somewhat aware, or not aware. All right, moving to the next slide. So this takes us, David, to uh, best practices. So given the landscape of what's going on with, with data tracking and in particular decisions in the Ninth Circuit, um, what would you advise are best practices in, in light of these recent developments? Okay, um, you know, happy, happy to give um, from a non-technical perspective telling companies what they should do perhaps to avoid getting sued by firms like mine or 
or, or Eves, and I think others might want to jump in and, and um, address this with, with more intelligence. Um, the first thing is absolutely websites need to be doing privacy audits. If you're going to integrate analytics tools or if you're going to integrate uh, similar social media widgets, there must be an audit of what exactly is being done. You can't just integrate an SDK or some other code from a big tech company and just say, look, hey, look at all this great analytics data I get. I can see with precision which users are doing what on my website and ad conversions and those sorts of data points because it always comes with the flip side that you are reporting that information usually on a user identifiable basis to Facebook or to Google or to the other companies. So it's not just that you're getting some great free analytics. It comes with the price of sharing your customer data with a third party. So you absolutely must do an audit of that code. You can't just integrate the code and hope for the best because now you are sharing information. Um, second thing is you should, you should probably do a, a review of the data flow um, because of the original conversation I had here at the beginning of this talk, right? The, the, what is tracking? It involves the first party website integrating code that then instructs the browser to make copies of information and send it to a third party. You ought to do, I think, an analysis of the HTTP traffic that's triggered by the code to see exactly what are you, act, what are you reporting. Um, so for example, say you are a, um, a medical provider, a hospital or a clinic, and you integrate analytics code on your website, what some companies don't realize is that the login to the patient portal along with important patient information that might be HIPAA protected is then being ordered to be reported to Facebook or to Google. That information may not be properly shared under HIPAA. So even if you think, well, hey, under double click, I, uh, I as, as a party to the communication, I have the authority um, to copy that communication with. I don't need the consent of the other party to the conversation. Okay, you may not have wiretap liability, but you might have HIPAA liability. So understanding the nature of the data, what's being reported, what is the actual impact um, of the integration of the technology. And finally, I would recommend that you should review regularly the terms of service and the privacy policies of the analytics company or the social media company whose code you are using. For example, Facebook developer platform tells its partner websites, hey, if you've got HIPAA obligations or COPPA obligations for, for children, um, or even if you have videos under the VPPPA, you need a separate standalone consent form before you're sending us all this information. And duty is on you, says Facebook. Duty is on you to make sure that you're getting that separate consent because if you integrate our code, we're going to get that data. So I would definitely review all the terms of service and privacy policies of the analytics company whose software you're integrating. Uh, Doug, Mio, you've been handling these types of cases before they even had a name. Um, can you share your thoughts and tell the audience why David's wrong? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I think the Facebook case uh, is quite interesting, and, and certainly uh, kudos and congratulations to David for achieving that uh, result uh, for the plaintiff's bar in front of the Ninth Circuit. Uh, but stepping back a bit, uh, the, these kind of cases uh, uh, relative to tracking and cookie setting and all of that, uh, from a defense bar perspective, we looked at these cases as sort of a yawn for years and years and years and years because ultimately uh, they were dead on arrival due to the inability of the plaintiffs to show any kind of damages as a result of whatever was done in regard to the, the tracking. Now, the third circuit case where I was lead counsel for one of the co-defendants there, that case was actually brought against four of the largest internet advertisers, including Google, uh, was an effort to solve that problem by the plaintiff's bar by bringing claims uh, challenging uh, tracking under the Wiretap Act. Why the Wiretap Act? Because the Wiretap Act has a statutory damages remedy uh, for a violation. And so the theory of the plaintiff's bar in the Third Circuit case was we can solve our damages problem by shoehorning this kind of conduct into the Wiretap Act, and presto, we've got mega liability due to the statutory damages remedy. Uh, 
we, uh, on the defense side, thought we had killed that theory in the Third Circuit decision, which, as David pointed out, rejected the wiretap claim. Uh, David said that the case was sort of a split decision because uh, the claim did survive on a state law theory against Google. But I, I would challenge that. Uh, ultimately, for example, uh, the state law claims in that case weren't even made against the other defendants because really everyone recognized that the money in the case would be in the Wiretap Act claim. And while the state law claim did survive against Google, ultimately there was a settlement done there that was uh, uh, nominal in amount of that claim. So now we come forward to the Facebook case where the Wiretap Act theory with its statutory damages remedy was tried again. And lo and behold, uh, again, congratulations, David, uh, the Ninth Circuit disagreed with the Third Circuit and created a circuit split in terms of whether the Wiretap Act uh, could be applied to uh, the tracking. Uh, the issues there are really uh, whether or not uh, the, uh, the, the Facebook entity in this context is a party to the communication, in which case it's exempt from Wiretap Act liability, and whether or not the Facebook entity is uh, intercepting the communication. Uh, if it isn't intercepting the communication, then it has no wiretap back liability. Third Circuit uh, went one way, Ninth Circuit's now gone the other way. There certainly will be a cert petition, and we'll see uh, if the Supreme Court uh, takes the case. I think there's probably a pretty good shot of that occurring. Uh, and then we'll see, uh, given whatever the composition of the Supreme Court is, in 2021, whether the Supreme Court were to, would follow the, I think, very, very pro-plaintiff, pro-consumer outcome uh, that the Ninth Circuit adopted, I think it probably won't. Uh, now, the other aspect of the Facebook decision that's quite interesting is uh, what David alluded to in terms of the unjust enrichment theory of, uh, of standing. And Respectfully, I think uh, David significantly overreads the significance of that. What the Ninth Circuit said was that unjust enrichment, uh, and even unjust enrichment where there's no loss to the plaintiff, can be sufficient to create Article III standing. Now, one, you, know, you can debate whether or not that's uh, good law or bad law. Certainly at the moment, it's uh, the law for Article III purposes in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, in every other circuit in the country, it's not the law. But I think what's more important is to remember that the Ninth Circuit made that ruling in deciding on Article III standing. A entirely different issue uh, in every case is whether the injury that is standing creating is also an injury that's actionable as a matter of the uh, state law claim in question. And in fact, here, uh, in the Facebook decision, sorry, in the Facebook decision, the Ninth Circuit actually said, uh, uh, in the context of finding that there was standing uh, to assert these claims for Article III purposes, in footnote four in its decision, the Ninth Circuit said, by the way, each of these claims that we're discussing, as a matter of California law, requires a showing of damages. So what, what probably will be the outcome there is these claims will go back to the district judge and the district judge will now rule not as a matter of Article III standing, but rather as a matter of California state law, whether uh, unjust enrichment is a remedy that's available for the particular claim that's being made. Frankly, the Ninth Circuit has already said in its footnote that it's not a viable remedy on the four counts that were being discussed in that part of the decision. Uh, this this is actually already played out uh, in the way that I'm describing uh, before the Eighth Circuit in the super value litigation, where uh, at, in the standing analysis, uh, the district court there dismissed the case for lack of standing, went up uh, to the uh, Eighth Circuit. Eighth Circuit found that the injury that was alleged there was sufficient to create Article III standing. Back down to the district court, motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim under Illinois law, which was the applicable law, 
saying that the injury, even if it was standing creating, wasn't actionable under Illinois law. District Court dismissed the case again, this time under 12b-6, up to the Eighth Circuit. And the Eighth Circuit, looking at the exact same complaint, exact same allegations, found that the injury that they had earlier ruled was sufficient to create standing was insufficient to state a claim. That's where I would imagine things are going to be headed uh, in uh, the Facebook litigation, where uh, regardless of whether the unjust enrichment that was described there was sufficient to create standing, uh, as a matter of California law, at least in regard to a number of the claims that were asserted in that case, uh, it's not sufficient uh, as a basis for actually pleading a claim under that particular either statute, uh, California statute, or California common law doctrine. So, so uh, the important thing I think for folks to remember, whether you're an insured or an insurer, is that uh, just because an injury has been found sufficient to create Article Three standing doesn't mean that it's sufficient to state a claim. And I think what, again, you're going to see more and more and more is on the defense bar side of things, uh, companies not even bothering to make standing arguments and going, in effect, directly to the merits and arguing that the injury that's alleged, whether or not it creates Article III standing, uh, isn't actionable under the particular state law. And, uh, and the, the, the victories that uh, have been achieved in these cases, whether it's a data breach case or a privacy case like Facebook, uh, lately have really been much more uh, on state law actionable injury grounds rather than Article III standing injury grounds. So those are my thoughts on Facebook, James. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I think uh, you raised good points on the unjust enrichment. Of course, the Wiretap Act has, has uh, statutory provisions for, for damages as well which I think folks will need to consider. But uh, we have to move on to uh, geolocation tracking because I'd love to hear from Eve, who's been patiently waiting. Um, so let's move to that topic, which is, is related to what we're talking about. Um, Eve, could you tell us a little bit about geolocation tracking? Yep. Thanks, Thanks James. So um, for this panel, we're discussing emergent issues. Two issues that are at the forefront of my mind are geolocation tracking, like James just mentioned, and also ed track tech education uh, tech tracking, which I'll get to uh, after this. So what is geolocation tracking? Geolocation tracking refers to the practice of using location technology such as GPS or IP addresses to identify and track an individual's physical location through their smartphones. Uh, companies engaging in these practices uh, generally then sell this information on an open market. And the information collected can tell you a lot about a consumer. They include real-time location data um, that is then used to figure out with precision what stores consumers visit, how long they spend in specific aisles, how far they're willing to travel for products and services, and what days of the week they shop, or even what advertisements they should be seeing as they um, shop based on their locations. And this essentially has allowed companies to create dossiers of who we are, where we are going, and for how long. Now, with any kind of privacy case or violation, the big issue in these types of cases is, um, or at least what my firm is mostly concerned with is, are consumers aware of the tracking and what companies can do with this information? And are consumers consenting to the actions of these companies? Um, and consistent with this, there has been some litigation in this area, but admittedly it is quite limited. Um, and most of the litigation so far focuses specifically on companies that have not been forthright about what they are doing with consumers. For example, they are deceptive or misleading, or they are making representations about what they are doing and then doing the opposite. So with that in mind, uh, the first case I want to talk about is the state of Arizona's case against Google. Um, there, Arizona sued Google for allegedly illegally tracking Android smartphone users' locations, uh, essentially collecting information about residents' whereabouts, even if they had turned off such digital tracking. So this was a case filed after a multi-year investigation, and as explained in a complaint that is mostly redacted if anyone has tried to get the insight as to what's going on, the suit primarily addresses two of the settings on Google's phones, location history, and web and app activity. And for those who aren't 
familiar with those concepts, I'll provide a little bit of context. Um, so location history is a setting that saves where you go all the time on your mobile device. And this is turned off, and it is only turned on if a user chooses to turn it on. The web and app, the web and app activity is different. This is on by default and saves certain information about a user's activity on various different Google sites and apps. So the thrust of the, Ari of the Arizona Attorney General's complaint is that Google made specific representations stating that if you turn your location history off, um, the places you will go will not be stored, uh, basically suggesting that so long as this is off, no one is tracking your location or storing this information. Uh, it was later revealed, however, that even with the location history off, Google was collecting location information through other settings, such as the Web and Act, uh, web and Act activity, and they used that information to sell ads. Um, the, 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 um, the claims were brought under the Consumer Protection Statute, which affords statutory damages. Um, so I bring up this case for a few reasons. This case is in the very early stages. Google has moved to dismiss. Uh, I believe that motion is now fully briefed. There is no decision yet. Um, and the state of Arizona has filed a motion for partially summary judgment. But why it's significant, I think, is because it marks government entities' interest in these types of issues and wanting to get involved in this litigation. And that's of note because oftentimes in government cases, they don't face the same hurdles that a private consumer class action would face. Um, so I think it is very important to keep track of what these government regulators are doing. Um, so I think it's also important in this area to talk about what's going on kind of in the private litigation space. There is a similar case that has been filed against Google for the same, um, for the same issues. Um, by private consumers back in 2018. Um, there, the mobile device users brought a putative class action alleging that Google tracked and stored geolocation via various applications in violation of the California Invasion of Privacy Act and the right to privacy under the California Constitution. Uh, plaintiffs here were not successful, um, and, and that probably goes uh, to a lot of what Doug would talk about these claims. But what is important, and I think this ties back into what David was saying, is that the plaintiffs here have uh, been granted leave to amend, and they have done so. And then they have recently moved to add another claim for quasi-contract or in the internal to, uh, alternative breach of contact in light of the recent Facebook decision, um, where plaintiffs can bring suit based on an unjust enrichment theory and have standing as a result of the same. So. Um, like I said, there's not much to go off in this, uh, this area just yet, but I, leave, but I believe it's an area to watch for a lot of reasons. Um, one, I think you have a lot of government officials very focused on this issue, and it's a bipartisan issue. So I can see there being litigation, or I'm sorry, regulation coming down the pipeline that will address these concerns. Um, this tracking industry is new and it is growing. Um, as I'm sure the audience knows better than any of us, there are thousands of mobile applications that are collecting precise location information about consumers. And there are then more that are selling this information and aggregating it. Um, my firm has looked into various apps that um, do this. And, that, and while they let people know that they're collecting information, they don't let people know what they're going to do with that information. And I think that's going to be a focus of litigation in the future. Um, so so I, def I definitely think that this is an area to watch. Um, in terms of best practices, uh, kind of jumping ahead just in the interest of time, um, I think companies need to make clear uh, they need to make clear common sense disclosures about what information is being collected and how it can be used so that a reasonable consumer would understand what companies are doing with their information. Um, and then I think they also need to obtain informed consent from all, practice, from all practices in which they are engaging. So this includes not just consent about what they are collecting, but also what they can and will do with that information once collected. Um, and I think um, that's going to be the, the real focus of where litigation starts when companies aren't doing that. 
to jump right into the ed tech tracking, which I call kid tracking, um, because I think that, <laughs> that, that flows nicely. Yes, uh, no, no problem. I, I know we are kind of running short for time here. So um, the next topic I want to touch on is uh, kid tech tracking, as James refers to it. Um, not surprisingly, conversations around child privacy have increased a lot over the past few years. And this spotlight has only been amplified with COVID and the prevalence of remote learning. Um, for anyone in the audience with children, I'm sure you can attest to the fact that your kids are on their phone all the time. Um, so when people talk about ed tech tracking, the main thing that comes to mind is COPPA. And COPPA is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. It was enacted by Congress in 1998 in response to a growing concern over the collection of children's data on the Internet. Um, Congress here specifically sought to increase parental involvement in children's online activities, ensure children's safety during their participation in online activities, and most importantly, protect children's personal information. Um, so COPPA has various requirements. In relevant part, it requires that websites and online services fully and clearly disclose their data collection, use, and disclosure practices and obtain verifiable parental consent before collecting, using, or disclosing personal information from children under 13. Um, it also requires websites and online services to permit parents to review all personal information they collect and maintain um, from children under 13, and allow parents to refuse further use of that information. Um, and the other kind of important requirement is that websites may not condition a child's use of a site or service on the collection of more personal information than is reasonably necessary. And they must take reasonable steps to keep confidential safe um, and, and safe. So who does COPPA apply to? It, it applies to different, different parties and, it, and in different ways. So commercial websites and online services that are directed to children under 13 um, basically have strict liability under COPPA, and they have to use I'm sorry, and, and as compared to um, general audience websites. Um, so those general audience websites will only be held to the requirements of COPPA if they have actual knowledge that they are collecting, using, or disclosing personal information from children under 13, I'm sorry, which is an important distinction. Um, because, and it is so because app developers who, um, whose content is directed to children are strictly liable, like I mentioned, um, as compared with other companies um, who won't have to have, um, who will only be required to have actual knowledge. And this comes up in a case I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, relevant here, I think the big takeaway is that personal information is very broadly defined under COPPA. The, the regulations list various information um, that is included. I won't go through the whole list, but first and last name, online contact information, uh, a screen name, a social security number, any kind of persistent identifier, that can be used to recognize um, a, a, a person's traffic over time, a photograph, a video. So it, it's very broad and it was intended to be so. Um, a thing that has come up in litigation, which I'll discuss in a minute, is that COPPA prohibits states from imposing liability on commercial activities in a way that are inconsistent with COPPA. And we've seen a lot of arguments in litigation where there has been litigation that uh, certain state claims cannot be enforced if there is no uh, COPPA liability or because COPPA uh, pre preempts the litigation. Um, okay, relevant here and probably relevant to the audience and all your companies, in my, in my view, the, the problem with COPPA is that it can only be enforced by certain federal agencies, mainly the F type, FTC or State Attorney General. Um, and I say, you know, that's an issue for me because I do feel that the FTC doesn't have nearly enough of time to, um, to enforce this uh, very important legislation um, and, and law. And so you're not seeing as much litigation around this as you might. However, as I'll discuss in a minute, um, there has been an uptick recently in COPPA litigation that makes this an emerging issue. So some big settlements that we've seen over the last year or two. Um, YouTube and Google had a settlement with the FTC and the New York Attorney General to the tune of $170 million for alleged COPPA violations. 
there um, it was alleged that YouTube uh, was sharing um, sorry, illegally collected personal information from children without the parents' consent. This is by far the largest amount the FTC has ever obtained in a COPPA case since Congress enacted it in 1998. Um, the FTC also brought suit uh, this year against TikTok. Uh, TikTok ended up paying a multi-million dollar settlement, um, I believe it was $5.7 million, to settle claims that Musical.ly, which is a karaoke app, illegally collected personal data from children. So. In addition to this FTC enforcement, we've now seen states get involved in, um, in COPPA enforcement. Again, I think this is relevant for companies to know about, you know, because I think it shows a shift in what people are valuing as important and where the law might be trending towards. Um, so New Mexico has jumped into this. My firm actually represents New Mexico in a case against Google. Um, for violating COPPA by collecting data from New Mexico children under the age of 13 through its uh, G Suite education products and services, basically um, uh, an education platform that provides services to schools. Um, I can't speak too much about this case anymore because last week an order came down dismissing the state's claim, essentially finding that Google could rely on schools to get consent. Uh, we obviously disagree with that position and are in the process of determining what the next steps are going to be. Um, but it is significant to note that New Mexico did file suit against Google for violations of COPPA, again, showing that more public entities are um, jumping into this litigation. And also that they're hiring private firms to pursue the litigation on their behalf. Uh, another case I want to just talk about very quickly is another case that New Mexico has against Google, Twitter, and this company called Tiny Labs. Um, here, New Mexico alleges that Tiny Lab Productions, uh, the developer of a child-directed mobile game application, um, as well as other ad, work, ad networks, and the operator of a digital content store, uh, here at Google, violated COPPA and other statutory and common law claims by collecting personal information from children. Um, the complaint was dismissed uh, as to certain ad oh. Steve, I just, uh, just in the interest of time, um, I, I was hoping that Maybe Doug could jump in and give us one minute of his thoughts on geolocation and, and ed tech uh, from the Absolutely. perspective of, uh, of, of a defense lawyer. Where do Absolutely. you see this? Sorry about that. No, I'm sorry to Sure, know. Glad, to, glad to do that. And I think the, the additive issue that's quite significant when you think about the COPPA aspect of this is uh, the current effort by the plaintiff's bar to create private rights of action that were never intended. COPPA has no private right of action. Uh, CCPA has an extremely limited private right of action. What the plaintiff's bar is trying to do with statutes like COPPA, CCPA, and the list goes on and on, even Section 5 of the FTC Act, is to, is to create those private, right of action, private rights of action by using an alleged violation of COPPA or CCPA or the FTC Act as the predicate for liability either as a matter of common law on a negligence per se theory, saying that uh, the statutory violation satisfies the negligence per se element of a violation of law, or under state consumer protection statutes uh, on, under the unlawfulness prong that you see, for example, in the California statute and many other state statutes. Uh, whether this gambit will work in the long run, uh, I certainly hope not because it completely defeats the legislative intent in not having private rights of action under those statutes. But there's been some success in that, uh, in that gambit, and that is definitely something significant to watch. Thanks, Doug. Um, David, uh, we have only a couple minutes, but I was hoping you could have the last word and just walk really briefly through uh, data mapping, which I think is another kind of interesting and related topic um, to what we've already been discussing. Yeah, thanks, James. And it certainly deserves its own hour, maybe in another year. This will become a hot, hot topic. Data mapping. There's no law that requires data mapping, right? There's no law that says you are now uh, obligated to link every personal data point with the identity of the person it relates to. In Europe, they would call that a data subject. We don't use that verbiage here, but that's really what we're talking about. 
it's not required explicitly, but it's becoming a good practice. And in fact, it's becoming impossible to comply with some of the more recent mandates without data mapping. So for example, the CCPA, uh, which obviously deserves its own many hours of seminar, you know, the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act, um, certainly requires um, that you respect a customer's right and their request to delete personal information that you have about them. So if that request comes in, how do you do that if you haven't data mapped? If you have a significant California presence, how do you even know if you have a California presence if you don't track where the customers are located to see if you have to comply with the law? Um, so I would say the development this year of the effective date of the CCPA suddenly brings data mapping to the fore. In addition, the CCPA, in addition to giving the rights uh, to uh, have the information deleted, also say that the rules in effect, the disclosures in effect at the time that the data was collected will govern the use of that data. So it's no longer permissible to collect everything you can about a customer and then next year give a new contract, a new disclosure saying, here's what we're going to be doing with your data. If it wasn't disclosed at the time of the collection, it's no longer proper. So uh, it is possible that best practice might include the collection of the prior disclosures, your privacy notices, your terms of service, and linking them to the date upon which you collected the data. I don't know how one can comply with these new requirements without knowing precisely what data is connected to what customer. So I, it's a brand new area. It's, it's a new concept, but I think it's going to grow in importance um, radically. Yes, and it in, implicates uh, a whole host of industries. I agree. Uh, thanks, David, for that primer. Um, I do look forward to having a more fulsome discussion on that, um, maybe like you said, next year. Uh, to our, our final question um, for the audience, true or false, uh, COPPA requires verifiable parental consent before collecting, using, or disclosing personal information from children. True or false? And that will bring us to our close. One. Well, that concludes today's session. Um, and I think the debate uh, that we've heard from all the panelists really just reveals the fact that um, the, the issues here are live and um, yet to be decided. So uh, we're looking forward to kind of tracking all of this and, and seeing where it goes. Um, I want to say thanks to David, Eve, and Doug for uh, being such great panelists. I also want to thank uh, Net Diligence for, for hosting this event. Um, I wanted the audience members to know that uh, there will not be a live rollover, and any questions that haven't been answered by text will be followed up by email. Um, and as the presentation closes, um, we're going to show the polling results uh, from the questions that were asked during the presentation. So um, again, thank you to Net Diligence, uh, thank you to the audience. Um, goodbye, and take care.